Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm so happy uh, to present this, uh, this uh, uh, work today, which is on uh, renewable resources, uh, simply because uh, studies on renewable resources have not received much attention uh, in the past, especially in developing countries, and especially studies on fisheries and uh, small-scale fisheries for that matter. Uh, so I would like to begin by saying that renewable resources, if you think about them as fish stocks, uh, common grazing field, uh, <clears throat> underground water, uh, forest stocks, these resources could generate benefits from now into the future, depending on how these resources are managed. In effect, these renewable resources to most communities could be more beneficial than gold and diamond. Now let's think about this. Uh, in most countries in Africa, uh, royalties that are paid for gold extraction is so low. In fact, a study I did in the past indicated that uh, Ghana, for example, was receiving 3% uh, of the revenue that is generated from gold extraction. Uh, and many other countries also receive equally very low percentage uh, uh, royalties. Uh, a country like Nigeria, for example, did not have any percentage. The Minister of Mine has to decide how much the company has to pay the state. So when I did a calculation trying to compare that royalty that the country receives with the damage that mining does to the rainforest, and then considering just the non-timber uh, forest benefit alone to communities, I realized that the royalties, which is 5%, is much too low. In fact, the destruction of uh, the non-forest uh, and then the opportunity cost, which is the non-timber forest benefit that the, the community has to forego, was about 30%. So royalties has to be about 30% to just account for the non-timber forest benefit that the communities were losing. So in effect, uh, it, it would have been better for the communities to use uh, the forest for other benefits than for gold to be extracted, which requires clearing the, clearing the forest. And the same applies to many other resources, which generate so much benefit to communities uh, when, they are not, uh, when they are renewable. Uh, in the West poorest regions, these uh, this renewable resources form the bedrock of the societies, the communities. Uh, and these resources are usually owned and managed by communities as a community resource or a common pool resource. But what we have realized is that most of these resources are subject to overuse. In fact, most of them are overcapitalized, meaning that there is so much investment in the harvesting of those resources, and the harvest levels are not sustainable. And this situation is hardened in his uh, very famous paper that he wrote in 1968 uh, called The Tragedy of the Commons. Uh, well, there has been other concerns that have been raised that, well, if you allow communities to manage these resources, it is possible that they will design rules that will ensure that these resources are managed in a way that that tragedy will be prevented. But we also know that if the cost of harvesting the resource is very low, if it doesn't cost much to go there and extract fish or cut uh, uh, a tree in the forest, the competition to, have to, to harvest, to catch the next fish before my neighbor goes there to catch it, uh, there is a tendency that the harvest levels will be far more than what uh, should be sustainable, and in some cases, stocks can even collapse. Uh, <clears throat> so let's take example of capture fisheries, for example, meaning fisheries, fish in the wild, in the ocean, or in the lakes, uh, inland waters. Uh, in sub-Sahara Africa, uh, small-scale fishing, generates so much revenue. In fact, it could generate over $10 million a year. Uh, and then it also creates employment for a lot of people. Uh, it is estimated that revenue that is generated annually is uh, at least $2 billion directly. And there are other people who are indirectly involved in fishing activities like processing of the fish and trading of the fish and they get about two and a half times the direct revenue that is generated from just catching and selling the fish. Indeed, this gives us an indication that these resources are extremely important uh, for uh, rural communities and for most people in developing countries who are not even in rural areas 
in those countries or are not directly engaged in the fishing itself. The same applies to uh, forest stocks and then uh, groundwater, which is so important to a lot of countries. And now, as I, I said earlier, most of these resources are over harvested, implying that the rate, of, at the rate at which the resources are harvested is much higher than the rate at which the resource is replenishing itself, which is a problem. Now, let's take this graph, for example, about uh, uh, catch losses in countries in Africa. And then you can clearly see that for a number of countries, catch losses are very, very, very high, implying that they are catching more than they are supposed to be catching, and thereby having lower revenue than what the, the, the stock is supposed to be generating to these countries. There are a number of factors beside the competition for the stock that contribute to uh, over-harvesting of most renewable resources. The first that we've talked about is a situation where we have the resource harvested as a de facto open access, where anyone who has a boat can go there and catch fish, or a common grazing area where anyone can just stock it and, and send the heads there to, to, to consume, uh, I mean, uh, to feed in the area, or underground water where anyone can just uh, extract and use it for whatever purpose uh, he or she wants. Now, that is the first. The second issue is that there is what we can call misperception or ignorance about the biophysical dynamics of most of these renewable resources. There was an interesting study that was done, an interesting experiment, where fishing managers in a Western country sat in a room like you are here and were made to harvest the fish in an experimental setting and they assigned them the property right, the sole right to that stock. Yet they over harvested. Over harvesting means they were catching more fish than they were supposed to catch and therefore getting lower revenue than what they should have gotten if they had caught a little bit less than what they were caught, uh, catching. Uh, the implication here is that the dynamics, the way stocks evolve over time, is a little bit complicated and it's very difficult for most people to understand. So even if you grant uh, uh, societies or communities the sole right to manage, if they don't have good knowledge about the dynamics, the biophysical dynamics of the stock, it's possible that the next time you go there, they would have over-harvested the stock and the stock levels would have gone down much more than they are supposed to be. And of course, that explains why even in the Western world, uh, with all the best known policies that we have, some stocks have shown signs of collapse. Uh, the core stock, for example, uh, is a typical case in point. Now, the other problem is about uh, political expediency. In most developing countries, uh, fishermen, especially small-scale fishers, uh, form a formidable force in politics. You know, if, if, you, if, if you don't treat them well, they'll go to the pools and then they'll show you the, the way. They'll, they'll vote you out. Because of that, governments increasingly, uh, I mean, embark on perverse policies like subsidizing fishing inputs when there is clear signs that fishermen are getting less and less and less catch. In Ghana, we have subsidies on uh, fishing fuel, which is called premixed fuel. And sometimes government will buy outboard motors and then give to fishers at very subsidized prices when indeed we are supposed to be doing the reverse. Now, uh, just a graph here to illustrate something. When you look at this graph, if you consider this to be uh, the revenue from fishing, this is, of course, the maximum point, meaning that we are supposed to be investing this amount of effort in the fishing, right? But suppose that we misunderstand or we misperceive the dynamics of the stock. It is possible that uh, if that mis misperception led to this graph, and the true reflection of the fishery is supposed to rather be this, this effort level, even if we do the best to catch the fish at a level that will give us the maximum revenue, that can lead to the collapse of the stock. This means we have exceeded the maximum level of effort that we're supposed to be investing in the fishery. Okay, uh, so one question that we can ask is, are there ways of addressing this problem? Suppose we even understand the way the stock evolved over time, but fish, uh, the fish is harvested by a community, is there a way to formulate a policy 
that can address the overharvesting problem. So we have uh, a harvesting level or a harvest level that is uh, sustainable, that will yield benefit from time to time to time, uh, to <clears throat> especially uh, in developing countries. Now, let me just bore you a little bit, but I'll be very fast. So suppose we assume that this is the rate at which the stock is evolving over time. This is the growth of the fish, and this is the harvest of the fish. So in steady state, we are only harvesting the growth, so uh, x dot to be zero, and then we have an equation that says the growth of the fish should reflect the harvest. Now, if we solve, we have an equation that we call the yield function, giving us the relationship between harvest and then effort. Now, suppose we have a number of fishers in the fishery, and each fisher is investing a, an effort level i, and the total effort in the fishery is this, then the fisher's share in, uh, in the total revenue will simply be my effort divided by the total effort times the total revenue that comes from the fishery. Now, this could be maximized if we have a cost function for the fisher. This will be constitute the revenue or the profit, uh, the, the revenue function. This will be the cost, uh, the cost per unit effort times effort. So if we maximize this, we obtain a function that looks like this. Well, this is a very interesting relationship. What this is simply saying is that 1 minus 1 over n, n is the number of people who are engaged in the fishing, times the average revenue from the fishing, plus the 1 over n times marginal revenue is equal to uh, the marginal cost, which is the same as the average cost of fishing. If you have only one person catching the fish, then this is zero, so you have marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost, which is the uh, condition that we require for maximizing profit. However, if x is infinity, then we have Average revenue is equal to average cost, which is the level of harvest where profit is completely exhausted from the fishery, which is the open access equilibrium condition. So in effect, what I'm trying to say is that if you allow everyone to fish, anyhow, any quantity, this may be the level of profit because this level of profit, or this level of effort completely exhausts uh, profit in the fishery. Profit is zero at this point. On the other hand, this is what we want because this is the effort level that generates the maximum uh, different, difference between the revenue and the cost. So open access will be here. One individual will be harvesting this, and then common pool resource will be in between. Now, it is possible that if we can impose a tax on the cost per unit effort, we can now bring the system back to the first best uh, level, which means that uh, we can solve for uh, tau, which is the tax rate here, and we have an expression for the tax. Of course, if n is 1, meaning we have one individual, the tax is 0, meaning there's no need to tax if you have only one individual in the fishery. And if you have more individuals, the tax rate increases. And E here is simply uh, the yield elasticity of effort. Now, this graph also just illustrates the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> and then we, as we see, the tax is increasing in the number of fishers. So more people you have, the more tax you impose per unit of effort. Uh, on effort, and then, uh, uh, so let's, uh, okay, suppose we look at the fishery as something that is done from time to time to time in a dynamic way, then we have to think of all the stream of benefit that can be derived from the fishery. So we maximize not a static function, but a dynamic function over time. Now, if we do that, uh, I don't have the equations here, but I can always make it available to you, the tax expression becomes this. Now we can see that, again, if the number of fishers increases, then you must increase the tax on the effort. If uh, the price of fish increases, there's incentive for people to go there and catch more fish, so you increase the tax rate. If this country, social discount rate increases, meaning society doesn't care about tomorrow very much, then the tax rate should be lower. Uh, and then we use data from Ghana uh, to uh, try to illustrate this and then calculate a tax rate which should be imposed in the fishery, which is about 10.5% uh, on the effort. And fishing effort here, uh, a dominant fishing effort is uh, the premixed fuel that the fishing vessels use when they go to fish. Uh, and then if we do this for the dynamic problem, this will be uh, uh, the tax rate, which is 13%. And then we have shown, for example, that if the discount rate is higher, uh, the tax rate uh, should be lower. These are just simulating the results for the various configurations of those parameters that we used. Now, in conclusion, I would like to mention that uh, a large proportion of the world population 
uh, live in rural areas. They live in communities where the natural resources that are renewable in those communities form the basis for their survival. And it's very important we pay attention to that. Uh, and then, as I said, these resources are more beneficial than gold uh, because gold may generate a one-time benefit. And in this case, we have realized that because capital for extracting gold comes from foreign direct investment, the benefit that actually accrues to those communities and the countries that uh, attract this foreign direct investment is so low that it's not even able to internalize the environmental opportunity cost that comes as a result of mining. So it is very important that we design rules that will govern the extraction of these resources so that it doesn't benefit only the present generation, but generations after generations that will come to meet these uh, uh, resources. And we have seen that it is possible uh, to compute a tax rate, for example, that can target one of the main inputs that is used for, for extracting that particular resource, and that tax rate can generate the first best outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.